program that has been in the planning for several years, planning between the University of Curaçao and the, the government of St. Martin, that it has been approved by the Council of Ministers, and so green light has been given for the program to start. I know that lots of people on St. Martin, also many potential students, have been waiting for this, and I'm, I'm sure that they'll be pleased to hear the announcement. St. Martin has a need for people in the legal profession, and it is good for uh, them to be homegrown, and this is an opportunity for people to stay right here on St. Martin, especially people who are working and who are unable to leave their family and their jobs to go away to study, but who always had the desire to one of these days become a lawyer or to go into that profession. That opportunity has been uh, given to them now, and we're very pleased. Way back in, in the 90s, there was such an opportunity, and we can see several of our local uh, lawyers who are, are working and who were the results of that program, and we're looking forward to the program getting off to a good start with the number of persons who showed interest that they will come to the program, register, and uh, follow it. It's not going to be easy because it's going to be a program that will take place in the evenings and uh, also in weekends, I'm sure. But I'm, I'm very honored to know that there are people who will be willing to make that sacrifice uh, to be able to get a, a law degree. And I want to say thanks to the University of Curaçao, uh, Dr. Delanoy and Dr. Uh, Hout Appel for persevering, for planning, and for doing their utmost to ensure that finally the program uh, could be finalized. And also thanks to the University of St. Martin, um, who will be hosting this program throughout its duration, but who also will be tying into the program with a pre-law uh, course of study for those who do not quite meet the, the criteria to enter directly into the law program. You can prepare yourself. Uh, via the pre-law program and still get the opportunity to meet uh, and to accomplish your goal, which would be to become a lawyer. So on behalf of the government of St. Martin, I am pleased to, to say that the program has been approved and uh, you can proceed now with finalizing it so that very quickly students can start uh, and... Uh, be with their fellow students, I would say, in the University of Curaçao. So congratulations, Mr. Delanoy, and we're looking forward to be able to work with you and make sure that this program is a success. Also to you, Dr. Baez, and to you, Dr. Carter, congratulations. has been faithfully serving the communities of St. Martin, powering your home and our economy. Come rain or shine, our qualified team of professionals are working hard 24 hours a day to provide you and your family with safe, reliable electricity and water. We use the latest technologies and test our products daily to maintain the highest international standards. Our friendly staff is always there to assist you, whether in person, over the phone, or online. We are committed to constantly improving our products and services, making them more efficient, effective, and environmentally friendly to serve you better today and our next generation of clients tomorrow. GEBE, -E, powering a brighter future. Our friend Megawati is here with tips to save you energy. One, turn your airco temperature up. 
Two, use a ceiling fan instead. Three, buy energy saving products. Save some green with NVGE. TLM, connecting you. As a real economic impact of armor really taking place um, for government, and, and I look substantially at the jobs that have been lost or could be lost, the taxes that have been coming out of the sectors that are not open, and how much that has raised basically cost um, government in terms of um, less income for itself. Because I think we have to look beyond just the incentives that have been requested by one or two um, particular hotel groups and look at the global picture, or let's call it um, the island picture. If you look worldwide, incentives are not something new to St. Martin. Incentives are given throughout the world. If you look at one of the largest companies in the world today, um, the Amazon um, um, Group or Corporation, right now is looking to build new or uh, additional headquarters in the United States. And the United States of America, basically built out of the, the states itself, are all fighting each other for the ability to be able to have Amazon open up either a second headquarters or mini headquarters in their state. Additional 50,000 jobs, 12,000 jobs, and you know the incremental income that comes with that. Today, I look at it that St. Martin is also vying for potential investors to come to the island, or even, and I don't say only come to the island, but also the investors that we have locally to incentivize them to actually invest in basically an economy that has been hit nearly to the standards of World War II, which is in basically in, in Europe. If you look at what had happened in Europe in World War II days, it was a devastation similar to St. Martin. The only difference is, is our electricity is on and our water is running, but today, very few tourists are here on this island. The job security, the job opportunity is not there. So to say that incentive packages are something new to St. Martin, I can see that. To say that, um, that we have, okay, I would, I would say that the, the incentives that have been put forward by the group is similar to the, the, the notion of asking for the stars, but or trying to go to the stars, but actually ending up on the moon. If you're in a, in a discussion or negotiation process, you're always going to ask for much more than what you are really looking for, and at the end, you're going to end up somewhere. The, the question that I have is this negotiation has been going on for some time. Um, what can the minister, on behalf of the Council of Ministers, give us as an indication of, I mean, something must be, um, um, yeah, agreed upon, or something must be approved, or something must be in the works, something must be looked upon to say to St. Martin, and not just the Maho Group, here are the incentives for you to be able to invest in the country. We have always looked at, at certain other islands, in particular that of like Aruba, um, and I can even go on to St. Kitts, the Bahamas, Antigua, Barbados, and all of them have um, incentive packages that have been um, put forward. And I can tell you that in, in Aruba, it depends on the, um, the amount of room inventory and depends on the amount of um, um, investment that it depends on the amount of carpet income tax that is actually charged based on investment. So it is known um, to the investor that he's coming to the country.
Right now, an investor comes into St. Martin and says, um, I'll, I'll take you through the, 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 the idea. An investor comes in and says, listen, I'm going to buy, let's just say, the property at um, uh, Caravanserai, or one of those, and I'm going to invest $100 million, and I want a, meet, a meeting with the Council of Ministers. By the time he's finished with the Council of Ministers, he still has to go and meet then with the Department of Roaming, still has to go meet with the Minister then of Economic Affairs to get his license, go back to the Minister of Roaming, check what the permits are, what is the incentive policy we don't know, then go meet with the Labor Department to get his labor permits. And anyway, by the time we're finished with that, probably another year has gone by and we've lost $100 million because he can go right next door to St. Kitts meet with one ministry and basically approval is given and that investment happens over there. The problem in St. Martin, we are constantly on this door, that door. The only thing that I didn't hear the minister, and I say thank goodness for that, is that the Maho group didn't have to go and request a meeting with the World Bank because then it would be all over. Because the problem of St. Martin right now, and I've heard this in the past as well, the problem is we are we're giving fish to the people, letting them eat, and we're not teaching them how to fish. The problem with the World Bank situation that we have now in St. Martin is it's basically we're in the hospital, we're getting fed intravenously, and there's no possibility of looking for real food to feed the citizens of our country. The only way that we're going to be able to create jobs, create income for our country, is continuing to have the, public, the private sector invest in the country. There are many hotels that are still closed. Mr. Minister, if we look at just um, Front Street alone, and we look through the amount of hotels, and I look small ones, big ones, so you can go Pasa Grand, you can go to upgrading of Sea View, you can go at the issue of Great Bay, you can go at Naked Boy, um, Divi wants to um, look at increasing the amount of rooms there. I don't know what the situation is with that one. You're looking at Westin, still um, having a hotel closed, only partially being open. You have the debacle at um, Caravanserai, and I can go on and on. The question to me, the, has the Council of Ministers met individually with these resorts that employ hundreds of people, are equivalent to huge amounts of taxes that are no longer coming into the country? Have we taken an inventory of the amount of taxes, the amount of people that are no longer working, or employed partially and see how this fits. Because I'm, I'm very fearful that by the time the Ministry of Finance is prepared to bring a law to Parliament of coming with incentives, but then there will be nothing to incentivize. At the end of the day, you can see that Great Bay has been um, completely demolished. So it isn't even that you're go you were going to put some band-aids there and reopen Great Bay. And if the owner, and I, I could remember him stating um, quite clearly, look, they have the property. They can afford to sit back because they have other properties throughout the Caribbean. They have other properties uh, throughout the world. They can afford to sit back and not invest in St. Martin. The question is, can St. Martin sit back and not have them invest? How you doing? You busy? I hear just paying some bills, taking care of business. You know what it is? <laughs> I know you're doing your online banking. I don't have to stand in those long lines to pay bills. I can transfer when I want. I can check my account wherever. 
It's like the bank open 24-7. I even hear checking the statement right now as we're talking. How's Miami? Well, that's why I'm calling. I'm finishing up a few songs now. But I'm afraid that studio time might be more than I thought. And I was wondering if I could get some help with some funds and I could pay you back as soon as I get back to St. Martin. Let me check my account. How much you need? I think 500 should be enough. I can transfer it to you while online. Direct from me to you. No problem. Great. Thank you so much, Ma. I'll get online with Viv now. You know who you're for. <laughs> I need to know who you're for. Contact Web today for your complete personal online banking experience. Available for all mobile devices. The Winwood Islands Bank. Now your online banking partner in progress. Who you're for? TLM, connecting you. Actually, first off, I'd like to dovetail into the comments that uh, the Minister of Vromi made. Uh, we have a very good working relationship between the Ministry of VSA and the Ministry of Vromi. And as he has the consultants in, uh, EENG and World Bank, um, for the solid waste management project, there's a number of opportunities for us to dovetail into the work that's being done there. For one, the removal project in terms of the cleanup campaign on the island, part of that also in means that we would remove mosquito breeding sites and sites that would breed vectors, and we've managed to integrate the, um, our cash for work program into that program. So meaning that some of the material is distributed in areas where heavy equipment can't access. So it means that we are going to need people to go into certain areas and physically remove the debris and bring it into an area where it can be loaded into a vehicle. So our plan is to use people that are looking for work, that are unemployed, they would be paid a stipend, and this is funded through the World Bank. Um, so this is a good collaboration between the Ministry of VSA and the Ministry of Romi. The other thing is, in the preparations for the management of the dump, um, experts are coming in with equipment that can measure air quality. So as part of their tender process, in terms of making sure that the, um, the workers who are working at the dump understand what environment they're working in, there's also an opportunity for the Ministry of Health to dovetail into that and measure the air quality or the emissions that are coming from the dump. So while we have a pretty good idea you know, from um, academic research in terms of what you can expect is in the air. I mean, I don't think anybody has any doubts that the smoke that's constantly emitted from the dump has a negative health impact. But we finally have an opportunity to actually quantify it, to really understand exactly what's in there and what the risks for the community are. And perhaps from there, we can also better, better I mean, the best measure is, of course, to eliminate the fires at the dump but also what we can do from a public safety perspective. So lots of good opportunities for collaboration between the Ministry of VSI and Vromi. So um, the other topic I'd like to touch on briefly is we concluded last week a three-day health disaster conference. Um, in attendance, we had representatives from the Netherlands, Curaçao, Aruba, Bonaire, Seba, and Stacia. And we had all types of entities there, government, of course, the different departments of public health, um, Health care providers, such as the various hospitals, uh, locally, of course, the White and Yellow Cross and pharmacies and even family doctors, and, of course, the social insurance companies as well. The idea is this is a continuation on the cooperation agreement that we laid in place between the Kingdom partners, so we cooperate on health care. And uh, one of the outcomes from the meeting that was held in June of 2018, so just recently, between the various ministers, was that there would be a disaster um, committee and that the St. Martin would chair that committee and the idea is to discuss areas of cooperation for crisis and disaster, how we can support each other. And while it's clear there's obviously goodwill 
um, and there's general agreements in place to support each other in times of crisis and disaster, many of the details remain to be formalized, right? And when you look at what happened after Irma, very often it was in the details that we found problems. I'll give you just one example. Um, after Irma, there was a high-speed military vessel from the United States that came to deliver water for, for the country. And in speaking with the commander at the time, um, he indicated that he had diesel fuel, diesel on the, on the vessel. In other words, it was a diesel-propelled, um, fueled motor. And they said they would be happy to reserve whatever they needed to get back home, but whatever they had in excess, they were happy to leave on the island to help support the island. But this is a marine-grade diesel. And when I called around and said, okay, we have a, somebody who's willing to give diesel to the island, and you know, who can pick it up, and where can we use it? It turned into a whole line of questions about what was the grade of diesel, and is the fuel the right fuel to be used on the island? And in the end, ultimately, because of another storm or high waves, I can't remember, the vessel had to clear out and took the fuel with them. So by simply not being able to identify what was the specifications of the fuel that we would be able to use on island, we missed an opportunity for, for support. And those kinds of stories repeat over and over. So the idea of getting clarity in terms of the details is a critical part of our disaster preparedness program. And that was very much the focus of our conference last week. The goodwill is there, but we need to make sure that the protocols are in place. So we're talking about protocols for evacuation. So in other words, critical patients and dialysis patients. How exactly do we, how do we refer them abroad? How do we transport them? Who handles the expenses, et cetera? Protocols for non-critical or self-evacuated and mental health patients. So in other words, there are people on the island who feel like their health may not be in the best of condition, but they don't qualify for a critical evacuation but they decide that on their own they want to leave. So how do we ensure continuity of care for those patients? Um, mass casualty plan, if God forbid there, is, there are a lot of casualties, how do we handle that? Agreements, for example, between the hospitals, the labs, and pharmacies in terms of cooperation, specific protocols. How do we ensure that our pharmacies are resilient? You know, having a constant supply of medications after a disaster is an important part of our disaster preparedness. So what can we do to support the pharmacies, right? How prepared are they, and how do we communicate after the storm? Coordination of medical supplies. One of the things that we found afterwards is of course, there's lots of people who are willing to donate medical supplies, but without communications between St. Martin and the various donors, the donors tended to send whatever they thought we might need or perhaps whatever they had in surplus, but what they're sending might not have matched what the actual needs of the community were. So I think having lists ready in advance that we can already send out to partners and say, you know, look, chances are after a storm, if nothing changes, here's the type of additional supplies that we would need. It's been said that behind every door, possibility awaits. How much possibility depends on which door you open first. Every day, we help our customers discover the possibilities in their lives. It all starts with a conversation. Scotiabank. Discover what's possible. Now, when this whole thing is um, finished on Saturday, I guess it's the last day, what's going to happen from there? Well, we hope that by Friday, when your child has been bused to the venue, they would have come home with a list of organizations that they'd like to participate with. And hopefully on Saturday, you come meet that organization, meet the, meet the owner, meet the business, meet the organization, and sign up. And then you, on your own time now, go to these organizations and uh, participate in an activity. Our task was to create the platform for both. We've created a platform for the organization who would have probably not have enough funds to advertise and you know let people know they exist. You know, times are hard. So our job as the Department of Culture and Sport was to facilitate the process 
by creating a platform mm -hmm. so two entities can come together, the person offering a service and the person looking for a service. And that's it. We make it as pain-free as possible. We did not charge any of the organizations. We're providing the tent. We're providing the electricity. We're providing Wi-Fi. We're providing table and chairs. You know, for most of them. Yeah. And so you just have to come and bring out your wares. So um, in my in my in my short, I would say show up, show out, and you have to come do the same thing. Show up and pick up something. Uh, how many uh, uh, organization of the sports has has been invited to be there? All sport organizations have been invited to be there. We've definitely not discriminated. We have a list of over 20 organizations, sport organizations, that either function or are defunct um, here on the island, and we've invited all of them. We've only had responses from a subset of them. So I, we can anticipate between 10 and 15 sport organizations to participate at the event on Friday and Saturday. The same for dance, well, the same for the creative industry. We have everything from choir to dance to yoga to circle to gymnastics, a wide variety of activities. And this being the first showcase, I'm sure it will grow as time progresses. You know, um, we've also invited businesses that support the creative industry, for instance, in people that might, that might sell dance attire, you know, people that sell books or arts and crafts supply stores that offer, you know, arts and crafts supply stores. So it will grow as, uh, as all things do, and when people realize that there is enough sufficient activities to do on the island, so we're hoping that more people come out and take the time to really get to know what's out there for the betterment of yourself and your family. Any final last word that anyone would want to, to say at the wrap up? Uh, yeah, um, it's the annual Sport and Creative Industry Open House, the first one collectively with the Department of Culture and the fourth one on behalf of the Department of Sport. So definitely come out, it's this Friday, the 20, August 24th and 25th. Um, the Friday is from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. for the schools, and the Saturday is from 1 to 6 p.m. in the afternoon. It's all gonna be at Rahul Village Sport Complex, so one central, one central place where people can come, park up, and, 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 and enjoy. So hashtag Sports Matter, hashtag are you.